This is a revision video going through all of the required practicals for AQA GCSE Biology Paper 2. If you're not already, you definitely want to be prioritising the required practical activities in your revision because they make up 15% of all of the marks available in the paper. For GCSE Biology Paper 2, there are only four of these. So we start off with the reaction time required practical. Then if you're taking GCSE Biology, there's the plant responses one. Then there's the sampling practical and finally the decay practical, again, just for the triple scientists. So actually, if you're taking combined science, there are only two required practicals to worry about. For each practical, you should be able to write a full method, analyse data and also name the variables involved. The first required practical in this paper is all about testing your reaction time. Now, it's important that you understand that this is different to testing your reflexes. So reflexes are an automatic, incredibly rapid response that doesn't use the conscious part of your brain. Whereas in this ruler drop test, we're testing your reaction time, but you are consciously making a decision to try to grab the ruler. That's not something that's happening automatically. Now, the ruler drop test on its own is not the full investigation. We also need to be investigating something, changing something. So in this particular question, the independent variable is about whether or not the participant is listening to classical music. And then the reaction time is the dependent variable. But if we're using the ruler drop test, we're not examining that directly. What we're doing instead is using the distance that the ruler has travelled as a surrogate for the reaction time. So this isn't an investigation that is possible to do on your own, because if you did, you would know when you were going to drop the ruler and you could respond much too quickly. So you're going to need a partner to do it. To start with, you're going to support your hand, support your wrist on the desk or on a flat surface to stop your hand from moving around. And then your partner is going to take the ruler and they're going to position it so that the zero is in line with your finger and your thumb. So if you grabbed it as soon as they dropped it, you would still be grabbing zero. It's important that they're not above or below this point, because if they were dropping it from above, we would underestimate your reaction time. And if they were dropping it from below, then we would overestimate your reaction time. So the partner is going to drop the ruler and crucially, they're not going to give you any warning that they're going to do it. I've seen lots of people write about how they would count down before they dropped it, but this would give you warning that it was going to happen. And so again, we would underestimate your reaction time. The person with their wrist on the desk is going to catch the ruler as quickly as they can. And then we can measure the distance that's traveled, which as long as you've started at zero is just going to be the number that you're holding on to. And we can compare that distance to a table which will tell us your reaction time. Now, actually, it is possible to do this investigation without doing that step, because we know that if the ruler has traveled less far, the reaction time must be shorter, even if we don't know exactly what the reaction time is. But this step often comes up and so it's worth being aware of it. So having done this, um, this ruler drop test once, that's not the whole investigation. Of course, we need to change our independent variable. So we're then going to repeat steps one to six, but now playing the classical music and seeing whether that has an impact on the reaction time. We're also not going to do the investigation just once. So we're then going to repeat this several times and use this to calculate a mean both for without classical music and for with classical music. You're obviously not going to combine your two sets of data. And really, we probably also want to mention that when we're doing this, we're going to discard any anomalous results. It's particularly important that you um, discuss calculating a mean if the question asks about validity or random error. And then the one other thing that we should say is that actually you don't have to do the ruler drop test unless the question explicitly tells you to. Our other option is to use a computer program, say something that shows a picture on the screen and you click the mouse as soon as you see that picture. And that would then be measuring your reaction time directly. Using a computer program that asks you to click a button as an object appears is going to allow you to collect higher resolution data. And it's going to be more valid because there's no way that the computer can accidentally indicate that it's going to make the object appear in the way that your partner might show something in their body language that gives away that they're about to drop the ruler. But in order to use a computerized method, you need a computer and a program, and that might not be available for everybody. So usually in school, this isn't the method that we would use. 
The second required practical in the homeostasis topic was just for the triple scientists. You should have investigated the impact of either light or gravity on some newly germinated seedlings. To do this, you would probably have grown seedlings in two identical petri dishes or little pots of compost and placed one of them on a brightly lit windowsill or by a lamp and the other one in a dark cupboard. Alternatively, you might have positioned them at different angles to investigate geotropism. The independent variable would be whatever it is that you're changing. So in this instance, probably the light intensity because it's the easier one to investigate in school. The dependent variable would be the thing that you're observing, so probably how tall the seedlings grow or whether they grew towards one side or the other. It's important to control variables such as using the same species of seed, usually mustard or cress, sowing them all on the same day, making sure that there are the same number of seedlings in each dish and giving them the same amount of water and either a nutrient medium or cotton wool. So again, let's look at how we would write a method for this investigation. To start with, we need a whole bunch of seedlings and we need them all to be more or less identical. So the easiest way to do this is to just plant out a whole load of seeds, making sure that they're all the same species and just water all of them until they germinate, because some of them might not do. And then after we've got that bunch of seedlings, then we can divide them into a light group and a dark group. We're going to take some initial readings measurements to make sure that the two groups are as close to being identical as they can be. So, for instance, we're not going to include any teeny tiny seedlings that weren't as big as the rest of them within our groups. So we're then going to put those light seedlings at a fixed distance from a light source like a lamp or in school, you might have just put them on a windowsill. And we're going to put the dark seedlings somewhere that they're not going to get any light at all. So in a dark cupboard. Then we're going to leave them to grow for a couple of days because this tropism impact isn't going to happen immediately. And then after a couple of days, we're going to measure the height and measure the curvature and see whether there's any differences between the groups. The first required practical in unit seven is the sampling required practical. And this one is for everyone, including the combined scientists. The required practical centres around measuring the population size of a common species, something like clover or daisies, usually in response to an abiotic factor like light, moisture content or pH, although there have been examples of questions that deal with things like humans trampling, which would technically be a biotic factor because humans are alive. To estimate the population size, we use this piece of equipment, which is called a quadrat. It's a square frame and it often has divisions inside it to allow you to estimate what percentage of that quadrat is covered by a particular species. So not just saying, yes, there are clover plants or no, there aren't any, but saying, oh, actually, 50 percent of this quadrat contains clover. Depending on the exact experiment, you might be using random sampling or transect sampling. So transect sampling would be used for something where we're investigating an abiotic factor that changes gradually. So it could be something like the moisture content of the soil as we move away from a river. So it would be very wet next to the river and then the soil would gradually be drier the further away we were. Or, for instance, if we were investigating light intensity and we were going from just under a very big tree where it's comparatively dark to out in the middle of the field where it's much lighter. So in those instances where I want a transect, I'm going to use a tape measure to make a very long straight line. And at set distances, probably every five meters or every 10 meters, I'm going to put down my quadrat and record what the percentage cover of the species is or just whether it's there or not, depending on what species it is. Um, and also um, make measurements of my abiotic factor. So if I was investigating light intensity, I would use a light meter. For pH, I would use a pH probe. And for moisture content, I would use a moisture probe. So that's if I'm doing transect sampling. Now, alternatively, I might be investigating two very different sample sites. And this is particularly likely to be the case if we're investigating pH, because pH is largely dependent on what the soil is made out of and the rocks that are underneath it. So if I'm investigating two different sample sizes, um, sample sites rather, then I'm probably going to want to do random sampling. Now, it's really important that you understand that random sampling does not mean throwing the quadrat over your shoulder. Firstly, because that's not actually random. And secondly, because it's not particularly safe either. So to make this sampling actually random, what we're going to do is use two tape measures to effectively make a grid. 
So maybe you've gone 10 metres by 10 metres and that gives you 100 squares, places that you could put your quadrat down. And then you're going to use a random number generator. So you could use Excel or just Google and it will produce you a list of numbers and tell you which of those quadrats you're going to sample. So again, you would put your quadrat down in each of those positions, count the number of plants or assess the percentage cover, and then also make a reading of your abiotic factor. 10% of the marks in GCSE Biology are for math skills and not just any old math skills. It can't just be adding up numbers. They need to be math skills that are at an appropriately high level. So that means if you're taking the higher tier science exams, the maths has got to be hard enough to be on the foundation tier maths exams. And if you're taking foundation tier science exams, the maths has got to be maths that you weren't taught until key stage three, so secondary school. So actually, the sampling practical is a prime example of somewhere that they can ask you to use math skills like working out percentages, working out means and also working out areas. So be prepared to use those skills. Before you dive in, it's worth orienting yourself and getting a few little things jotted down. So firstly, for any kind of sampling question, we know we're going to be using a quadrat. And we also know that that's one of the very few words in GCSE science that we do need to spell correctly. Now, for this question, they haven't specified whether they want us to use random sampling or systematic sampling. And in this instance, either one would do. So I'm going to write you two methods, one for random sampling and then one for transect sampling. Um, we're investigating the impact of light intensity. So you want to describe how you're going to use a light meter to measure that. And also we've been asked about percentage cover rather than the number of individual plants. So that means we are going to need a quadrat that has internal divisions so we can see what percentage of the quadrat is covered by these clover plants. So first off, we're going to talk about random sampling. So we're going to need to identify a highlight area and a low light area. And we're going to split both of those areas up to make a big grid using some um, measuring tapes. And we're going to number every square in that grid so that we know um, maybe we've got squares one to 100. And then we're going to randomly pick 10 quadrats. It doesn't have to be 10. It needs to be more than one because that's the point of the sampling. And really, the more the better. But 10 is usually a fairly standard number. Now, since those quadrats need to be randomly picked, we could either use a random number generator or we could use coordinates. If it's a 10 by 10 grid, we could use um, a dice with 10 sides and roll it twice um, to tell us which coordinates we're aiming for. Then in each place, we're going to put down our quadrat and we're going to measure the light intensity using the light meter. And then we'll survey the percentage cover of the clover by counting how many of those internal squares of the quadrat are covered with clover. And then we can compare the percentage cover of clover um, in the two areas with the two different light intensities. So hopefully we're going to end up with a graph that looks something a bit like this. So we've got light intensity on the X axis. That's our independent variable. We've got percentage cover on the Y axis and actually clover likes highlight areas. It grows better there. So in the higher light environment, we saw more percentage cover. The alternative would be our systematic transect sampling. So in that instance, we would use a tape measure to form a transect that went from the highlight area to the low light area. And we would systematically place a quadrat every five meters or every 10 meters until we have at least 10 quadrats. And when we came to analyze our data for this, this would mean that we would have a kind of gradual pattern rather than having two different areas on my graph, I would have a gradual transition from the low light to the highlight. The final required practical is just for those taking GCSE Biology. So if you're taking combined science, you are done for this paper. If you're taking GCSE Biology, then you would have done the milk practical, which is meant to be about decomposition, although really it isn't decomposition. It's just another optimum conditions for enzymes working practical. You start with tubes of milk, lipase enzyme and sodium carbonate buffer. If we were really investigating decay, then we would use raw milk, which still has bacteria in it, rather than using the lipase enzyme. But this way is a bit safer and a bit cleaner and just also a bit easier to control and be scientific about. So we start with these tubes of milk, lipase and sodium carbonate buffer, and they are put into water baths and a thermometer is used to ensure that the tubes are all at the correct temperature before they're mixed. 
As the lipase breaks down the fats in the milk, fatty acids are released and they lower the pH. And this process can be monitored with a pH probe and can be timed. The experiment is then repeated with tubes at a different temperature. The faster the pH falls, the closer to optimum temperature the enzyme is. If a pH probe is unavailable, then you can still achieve valid data by using a pH indicator that changes colour. So very often we use phenolphthalein because this turns bright pink in an alkali, but then is colourless in an acid. But this is much more subjective than using an instrument. In this practical, the independent variable would be the temperature that the reaction is taking place at. The dependent variable would be the length of time that it takes for the milk to reach a certain pH, maybe pH 4 or pH 4.5. And the control variables would include the volume of milk, the volume of lipase, the volume of sodium carbonate, which is in there as a pH buffer, and the concentration of the lipase enzyme. So you start off by getting your tubes of milk and then also your tubes of sodium carbonate and lipase. It's okay to mix the sodium carbonate and the lipase before they go together with the milk, but you can't mix all three together because as soon as you do, your reaction is going to start. Each one of these needs to be at a different temperature. So the easiest way to do this is one set of tubes in an ice bath, one set at room temperature, and one set at a 30 degree water bath. We can't really use very high temperatures because these would denature the enzyme and then it wouldn't work at all. We're going to use a thermometer to make sure that they have um, reached stable temperatures. And then we can add buffered enzyme to each tube of milk and start the clock. We can monitor the pH of each tube with a pH probe. And as we know, as the lipase digests the lipids, it will make fatty acid and glycerol. And the fatty acid is going to lower the pH. And the faster the pH falls, the closer to the optimum temperature the enzyme is. We could also describe how we would repeat steps one to six for each temperature, take out any anomalous data and calculate a mean time taken for each temperature. And that's it. Thank you very much for watching. And I hope you're now feeling a little bit more prepared to talk about the required practicals in GCC Biology Paper 2. If you did find this video useful, then don't forget to like, subscribe, comment and share. And I'll be back soon with some more GCC Science Revision videos.